So this talk is kind of a mashup of a talk I gave at the uh, Analytics Forward on conference and a talk I gave at this seminar at Duke. Um, so I, I kind of uh, put the two together. So I'll, I'll start off. Uh, the topic, of course, is working with geospatial data in R. And I'll start off just by talking at a high level about um, how I think that uh, you know we're poised right now to, to really have a lot of geospatial tasks that used to be um, very challenging for data scientists or analyst type folks to do um, f to be a lot easier. Uh, and I'll talk about why. Um, and then I'll get into you know, more technical information. We'll be showing a lot of R code about how you can wrangle data, um, you know, import data and export data, and do some manipulation and um, analysis of geospatial data with R. And then I'll talk a little bit at the end about um, how you can go into more fancy uh, geospatial analyses um, like uh, Krieging. Uh, I'm not actually going to show that, but I had to say it because Brian wanted me to. So, <laughs> uh, to show I, I know how to pronounce that word. But uh, um, anyway, so without further ado, um, so in the past, um, well, let, let, me, let me start. Let me stay in sync with my slides here. So every company and organization uh, really captures a huge amount of location-based data, whether or not they even know they're they're capturing it. They're conscious that they're capturing it. You know, every address has a zip code at least attached to it, or can be geolocated to a specific point using like Google APIs. Um, and you know, you've got facility locations, customers, suppliers. You know, third-party demographic data. A lot of companies use data from. Um, you know, companies like Nielsen uh, to get demographic data on their customers. There's census data. There's uh, so much data with geographical or spatial components attached to it. Um, and all that data can have tremendous value if it is put to productive use. So, uh, you know, often uh, if you can enhance some other business data you have on sales, on, you know, profitability, on um, your products with data on you know, where are the people who are buying them? Uh, where are the stores that are stocking them? You know, all kinds of other spatial data complementing your business data can create huge value. Um, and even just mapping, it's amazing how many uh, folks who, who are, you know, working with business data um, don't put it together with spatial data and map it. And they miss out on all the insights that you'd get uh, from that, you know, what should be a pretty simple um, step of just mapping your data. And I think the reason why this has happened is because in the past, in order to take advantage of geospatial data, you have had to be a GIS expert. Uh, I mean, obviously, most people can take like latitude and longitude data and plot it on a graph, you know, on the x and y coordinates. But if you're doing anything more complicated than like uh, than that, like dealing with um, you know, polygon shapes, shape files. Um, other kind of databases, geo databases, and so forth. Typically, that has not been a skill that general analysts or data scientists have. It's been a, the skill of a GIS professional. Um, and there have also been specialized GIS tools. So we don't think of tools like R and SAS and Python and MATLAB as, as being very good with, with spatial data, with geospatial data. Um, and you know we think of tools like ArcGIS and things like that uh, for heavy duty lifting uh, for spatial data, um, and those tools, the the professional GIS tools, often don't integrate really well with uh, other kinds of you know business analytics tools, uh, and so the, you know kind of there's been a situation where these two worlds have not met. Um, obviously, there are exceptions. You may, you know, be listening to me and saying that's ridiculous. I work for a company that has the best integration in the world of their geodata, and you know, you can tell me afterwards. But uh, on average, I found this to be kind of uh, the the situation. Um, and there's been a increasing recognition recently of the need to bring location data into the mainstream of analytics and data science. And there are, I'll, these slides, by the way, are published online. I'll show you where afterwards. Um, and so you know, you get heavyweight, you know, business uh, um, uh, like business school publications saying we need location analytics. Um, you know, we need to be able to do a better job uh, driving value from location data. Um, and really, they're all just being paid off by Esri to say that, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll pretend it's true. So the, um, the cool thing is you don't need to spend millions of dollars on Esri. Sorry if you work for Esri. They're the you know, premier vendor of, uh, um, of GIS software. Uh, but 
a lot of uh, what you might want to do with geospatial data is possible with R. Um, I'm sure it's also possible with other tools like Python, and I'd love to actually hear about that from anyone who's more familiar with other sets of tools um, than myself. I'm, I'm an, an, you know, religious about R, so sorry, <laughs> that's what I'll talk about. Um, but R provides really a very powerful uh, set of tools for working with geospatial data. Um, R is also very widely used and widely integrated with other software. Uh, and so even if you're not an R user, you can, through the integrations of R with any other software you work for, things like Tableau or you know, the company I work for makes uh, Spotfire or ClickView or Excel, for that matter, any of these other tools, you know, they all integrate with R. And um, they, you, you, know, you can use R's tools for geospatial analysis and so forth through those tools. So I think you know, as a result of that, <laughs> as a result of that, um, many of these kind of important tasks that I'll talk about, uh, geospatial data manipulation analysis tasks, are within reach um, more than before. All right, so uh, that's enough with the high-level mumbo-jumbo stuff. That was basically the talk I presented at Duke. Um, I didn't give much technical uh, information. No, <laughs> it, was, it was actually deeper than that, but uh, uh, it was pretty fluffy. It I, yeah, right. I mean, it's Duke, so... Yeah, it's a bunch of business school people or something, but uh, <laughs> so this is the, the the stuff I'll show now is um, much more technical and having to do with R specifically, and we'll show a lot of code. Um, uh, and this is basically the talk I gave at the Analytics Forward Conference, which uh, Aaron and the rest of the Aaron Terry from uh, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield and the rest of the you know our uh, the um, analyst group uh, organizers helped to put together recently. Um, so I'm just going to give an overview of like what are all the facilities in R uh, for working with geospatial data, and I'll try to make this as accessible as possible and um, show you, you know, what are some of the common tasks that you'd want to work on with geospatial data. Um, and just to say, uh, you know, at the forefront again, any software, including Excel, can load in data that has a latitude and longitude column you know, uh, that represents points. And that is an important um, you know, piece of functionality that R has as well. Um, but if that's what comes to mind when you think of geodata, there's a lot more. And so I'll, I'll be talking about you know, what more is there. So um, R itself, the, the base uh, R package that you download, has no, or, you know, the base R installation. Uh, doesn't have um, capability to do all the um, the geoanalytics or you know geospatial data tasks that I'll show today. You really need to use several packages um, to to accomplish these things. And the two most essential packages for um, geospatial work in R and also spatial work. So it's, I say geospatial, which is you know coordinates of the Earth. There's also just other spatial. Uh, spatial analysis, like uh, you know, on a, a, a showroom floor, or a basketball court, um, but the SP package is the cornerstone uh, of all this, and it is uh, it defines classes and methods for spatial data, um, and these don't exist in base R; they're all defined by this SP package. And then this other package, RG doll, um, is very closely related to the SP package. What it does is it um, brings this, this other piece of open source software called GDAL, the Geo, uh, Geospatial Data Abstraction Layer, and it provides all of its functionality to R. Um, and it includes this Geospatial Data Abstraction Layer. So with this GDAL package, you can do things like read and write shape files, read and write from geo databases, and you can connect to virtually any um, you know, geo data format you can imagine. I'm sure there's a few that only Esri can do, but it's pretty, pretty amazing uh, set of data sources and um, uh, you know formats that, that that supports. And then there are several other important packages that you're likely to encounter very quickly if you're doing geospatial work. Geosphere, the Geosphere includes a lot of the math of um, the curvature of the Earth. So if you're calculating distances and so forth, you know you can't just do. Uh, um, the square root of x, the difference in x plus the square root plus the difference in y squared. I barely remember that stuff because I use R to do it anyway. But uh, the uh, the geosphere package has all that math in it, um, 
And then RGOS and Map Tools are two packages that provide like alternative ways to do some of the same stuff and shortcut or you know more convenient ways to do a lot of the same things like um, you know reading uh, reading geospatial data and so forth. So I'm going to show examples of all of these these different packages that work, but I'm not going to break out necessarily which packages do what. So if if you want to follow along, just go ahead and install all these packages, these five packages, and load them up before you get started, and you can't go wrong. So. Um, all right, so the, as, I said, as I said, the SP package defines uh, all the classes and key methods for spatial data. And there are really six classes that are at the center of this, um, this package. Um, spatial points, spatial lines, and spatial polygons. Uh, these are the elementary classes that this package defines. So they're pretty much what they sound like. You know, you have uh, points, very simple to represent, x and y coordinates. Um, you have lines, which are somewhat more complicated. It really means like you know line segment. Uh, it can be you know any string of points start that starts and ends at some point. Um, it has all the points in between. Um, and then polygons are you know in uh, in two dimensions. So you've got um, well, so are lines, but <laughs> polygons and endpoints. Polygons are we all know what polygons are shapes, right? And uh, they can have holes in them as well. So um, you know, all, all of the different shapes that you can create uh, can be represented through those objects. Um, and then there are three extensions of these, these elementary objects that have data frame at the end of them. And what these objects allow you to do is to attach data to that spatial information. So if you have, you know, the shapes of um, North Carolina and South Carolina, and then you have some data that's like, you know, what's the population and the GDP of each of those states. You can't store all that information in a spatial polygons uh, object, but you can store it in a spatial polygons data frame. Uh, it's just because that the supplementary information is in the data frame piece that's attached to the spatial, uh, the spatial polygons piece. So if you have data in those formats, well, what are some common things you might want to do with it? Um, and again, I'm starting off here talking more about just wrangling input and output and basic manipulation of this data, not fancy analyses like Krieging. See, I said it again. Um, so some of the, the, the simpler things you'd want to be able to do is read and write um, spatial data. And this could exist in a spatial database or in any number of formats, but uh, often the, uh, the shape file is the sort of most common format that you'll see spatial data in. If you go to the Wake County government um, website and want to download something about you know, flood zones or whatever they're in charge of, they, you know, you, most likely that will be distributed in a .shp file. Well, it's really a zipped file which contains a .shp file, but it's called shape files. So you'll see this term all over the place. Um, the Census Bureau, the, uh, you know, every, every federal government agency that distributes um, information that has uh, polygons or lines, it's almost all in shape files. Yeah. Uh, will KML files uh, qualify, or do they have to be transformed into a shapefile format? Yeah, I, I'm not going to guess specifically into KML, but the, there are tools to um, to to uh, you know pull KML data, and that's all in. I think it's not in maybe not in the packages that I showed, but there's other packages that can pull in KML data, and I'll show you um, soon where you can kind of uh, see. You know what's available beyond the limited you know scope of what I'm showing here. So yeah, I've, I've done some stuff with KML data a long time ago. Yeah. You'll probably answer this later on. So a, a more and more, at least in North Carolina, rather than having the download of the shape file, they just have the pointer to is what, what's the web service? Is it called Map Services? Oh, like a yeah. a web map service, WMS service, or something like that. Yeah, is that what it's called? Okay. Yeah, there are a, so. Yeah, I'm sure it can. I'm not so familiar with that. There's a, a bunch of um, different standards for uh, online distribution of map information. And um, I mean, some of them are just really files sitting on web servers. Some of them are things like you know KML, where it's a markup language. There's also a whole, um, a whole uh, format called Web Map Service, or WMS, and something else called Web Feature Service, or WFS, that are ESRI standards. and to use those things, you need to set up a whole web service. It's like basically this just protocol for communicating um, with clients and passing that um, polygon or point you know, information, or it can pass images even. Um, and R can definitely get to all that stuff. 
you know, there's very likely to be any format that R can't access. Um, but I'll show you shortly how you can, you know, look at that. I'll, I have a, there's a page um, that that is like a, has a wealth of information about all that stuff. So I'll show that um, in just a few minutes. So back to the common tasks that you might be interested in, in doing with uh, geospatial data. You know, reading and writing it, of course, and I'll get more into other formats. Um, also, just plotting it, just basic plots. I'm not going to go into great detail about this. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do with plots. And you know, R has uh, several different systems of, of plotting. Each of them has its own way of dealing with maps. I'm not going to get deeply into that, but I'll show some basic examples. And again, show you where you can get more information. Um, another key task, and this is where people start to get really lost very quickly. Uh, this is where I got lost really quickly. Uh, and this prompted my interest in this actually was it was so frustrating uh, when you download data from like say the Wake County government um, it, you'll sometimes look at the coordinates it'll have like latitude and longitude cord latitude and longitude columns and you look at the coordinates and they'll be like you know 12 digit integers and they don't look like latitude and longitude numbers. And if you don't understand coordinate reference systems, you start to tear your hair out. Like, what, is, what are these numbers? Um, and the reason for this is because the you know, spatial data, geospatial data, can come in any number of coordinate reference systems. These are just different ways of taking um, numbers and mapping them to points on the Earth. And uh, there are the common ones that we all know of. The co most common one that we all know of is latitude and longitude coordinates. And even there's not, unfortunately, there's not even one system of latitude and longitude coordinates. There's a bunch of them. Until the 70s or 80s, there was not even one globally consistent method of, uh, of giving global latitude and longitude coordinates. There were like a bunch of regionally valid ones and none that were global, which is crazy. Um, only with the rise of like GPS uh, and you know some of the related technologies did did everyone finally agree that we needed a globally uh, applicable coordinate reference system, and that became called WGS84. So I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But um, this is a real challenge: uh, co transforming coordinate reference systems. So I'll talk about how you can how you can do that. Um, now getting a little bit less uh, into, a, a little bit away from sort of wrangling and more into things that look a little bit like lightweight analysis, um, sometimes you're interested in taking a, and figuring out, okay, which point polygons. So the, I'll show examples of this, but you know, if you have a, um, you could count how many crimes occurred in which um, tools like R uh, can, can do that. It's like calculating the area and perhaps the lengths of lines, things like that. Just simple uh, calculations are important. Um, also calculating, uh, calculating great circle distance, um, the, you know, distance between, you'll end up with a slight error. Um, we, you know, to do accurate distance counting, the, you know, uh, so that, yeah, so that's the list of common tasks as well, but these are sort of uh, common things that you see. You know, mark down her. I see. I'm so new to this big. Uh, I work for Tibco, um, this this company, and you know, I have all these business. I've been late to the game with this uh, mark. Uh, <laughs> so these are these uh, that I mentioned before. So the first step here is examples um, about how you can you know accomplish some of these tasks. Use it as ideal. Can can people see this? It's. I, I wish it was larger. Um, unfortunately, there's not much I can do. Can we turn these lights off? Yeah, maybe we can. That's a good idea. Or Seth's light dimmer. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'll try to blow it up a little larger as well, but um, I'm sorry. Again, they are online, and actually, um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll send out the link to where they are online right afterwards, so um, you can um, try to follow along as best you can, and then run the code yourself later. All right. So. Um, shape files. If you have a shape file, uh, I'll just quickly um, show what this is like. Um, if you have a shapefile um, in, and you've downloaded it, when you download a shapefile, it comes as a zip file. And then you unzip it, and you end up with a collection of at least three up to you know, eight or more different files inside the zip file. One of them is always going to say .shp. It's going to, always going to have the .shp extension file inside. Um, and so that .shp file is um, 
the pointer that R will always need to load a shapefile. So say you've downloaded a zip file that has been, you know, uh, it, it represents a shapefile. You've unzipped it, and you've got that .shp file, and you'd like to load it into R. Um, there's a few steps you need to go through. It's a little bit more complicated than just something like read, you know, the read.csv function in R. You need to, you know, uh, say where that shapefile is. Then you need to take a look at the layers that are inside it because um, shapefiles can have multiple layers, and you can only load in one at a time through this system I'm showing here. So what we do here is we run some code that shows that inside the shapefile there's only one layer. This OGR list layers function tells us that there's only one layer inside this shapefile. It's called planning neighborhoods. What this shapefile is is a um, shapefile I downloaded from the San Francisco City Government Data website that has. Uh, polygons defining the shapes of all the neighborhoods in San Francisco. Um, and the name of that layer within the file that contains that information is planning neighborhoods. And it gives you some other attribute data. It's an Esri shape file. So when you know the, the name of the file and the name of the layer that you'd like to grab out of it, then here's the key function for reading shape files and also for reading a diverse other number of formats of spatial data in uh, you know, in R, it's read OGR, and this is the, this is part of the um, RG doll package. Yeah, it's part of, <laughs> I said I wasn't going to tell you what package things are in, but uh, it's part of the RG doll package. Um, and uh, when you load it in, uh, I will assign it to an object called neighborhoods, uh, and then it's it's read into uh, R, and it, it tells you when you're reading it in that it's a uh, shapefile and it's got 37 features. Um, and those 37 features, in this case, represent the 37 neighborhoods in, in San Francisco. So the class of that object, neighborhoods, that you read in is spatial polygons data frame. So that should be familiar if you were listening to me before. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's a, an object that contains definitions of polygons and also has data supplementing those, those polygon shapes. Uh, and if we call like length on it, it gives us 37. There are some other functions we can call um, on that neighbor. We can, you know, pass that neighborhood's uh, object to. Um, when you call uh, plot on a spatial polygons or spatial polygons data frame object or any of these other spatial objects defined by the SP package, you get a plot in the R graphics device. So you can see this is just a pretty, you know, simple plot of all the neighborhoods in San Francisco, um, right there. So. Now, um, if you take a look at what the actual numbers inside this shapefile are, um, you will get to see the confusion I was talking about before. Um, when you call this function bbox, it gives you the bounding box of any spatial object, which is basically you know, the minimum, maximum, x and y coordinates. Um, so the, the entire city of San Francisco fits within this box. But what the heck are those numbers? They don't look like latitude and longitude numbers. Uh, well, they're not. So um, this data file, as are most data files you'll find uh, you know, for download from local governments and organizations, are in projected coordinates. They're not in regular um, WGS84 latitude longitude coordinates. And there's a handy function called proj for string. Um, that you can use to figure out what is the coordinate reference system of any imported uh, spatial object. Uh, this gives you something pretty ugly. Uh, it's, uh, it gives you a really long string which is running off the end of the screen. Um, coordinate reference systems are not a very user-friendly topic. Um, however, I'll tell you about a couple resources you can use to find out more about these. Um, so what we'd like to do is transform this coordinate reference system into some other coordinate reference system. You know, it, well, basically, we'd like to get latitude and longitude coordinates. Because typically, if you're bringing in data from diverse sources, you want everything ultimately to be in WGS84 globally um, you know, accurate latitude and longitude coordinates. Because that's sort of the common language uh, that different spatial data should speak. Um, so. Fortunately, you don't need to know what this means. You don't even need to copy or paste it or anything, because there's some very handy functions that you can use to transform any object that you've imported into um, R to this WGS84 coordinate reference system. Um, and specifically, there's this function sptransform. 
also part of the RG doll package, um, that you pass to it the spatial object in any coordinate reference system, and you also pass to it a new coordinate reference system that you'd like it to be transformed to. Uh, this is, again, still not a very pretty string here. What this, this, this text string is, it's called a proj4 string. Uh, and this is probably the most complicated thing I'll say today, is, uh, with the, these proj4 strings. Um, they uniquely specify coordinate reference systems. Um, and there are some handy websites out there, including spatialreference.org, that um, are sort of a Wikipedia of coordinate reference systems. And um, the most common coordinate reference system is this, again, um, WGS84 coordinate reference system. And so if you ever want to know what should I set my, um, my CRS to, to have it be in um, latitude longitude coordinates, look up the WGS84 coordinate reference system on this site. Wow, that, leads, that yields a whole lot of confusing search results. Well, you know what? Google it. Um, so, so do, say, uh, uh, you know, WGS84 um, proj4 string, and it will certainly come up. So, yeah, so this brings you to the right one, it, actually the spatial reference site. So th this, is, uh, this, is, this is the page representing this, this coordinate reference system, the most important coordinate reference system we have. And you can download um, representations of that unique coordinate reference system in any of these formats. And the one that R is most easily able to work with is Proj4. So um, click on Proj4, and you end up with exactly the string, the text string that I showed you before. Um, so that's the one you will use to convert data to latitude and longitude. So that's what we've got there. What we do is we, we, we need to use this function CRS. The CRS function creates a coordinate reference system. You pass it a proj4 string, and it creates a coordinate reference system, which then can be used for transforming and other things. Um, so that's, that's the gist of that. Yes? So the bottom line is that that string will convert the, will transform the, the whatever you have into latitude and Yes, irrespective of what its original format is in, that string will convert it under normal circumstances to latitude and longitude. There are some edge cases. Uh, if, you, if the coordinate references, if the origin coordinate reference system is not fully specified, which occurs in some cases, uh, your mileage may vary and you may get um, strange things where the results are off by hundreds of meters. Um, Pretend that doesn't happen, because it's very rare. Uh, but it, it, all these things need to be sanity checked, um, because uh, you know it, it, sometimes people are sloppy about creating um, these Proj4 strings uh, on the receiving end. And then you get a file that is, uh, it doesn't fully specify what its uh, you know, parameters are. And then it can't be converted correctly. Yeah. And you can make, you can make your own conversion? Yeah. You roll your own conversion? Well, you can, this Proj4 language, it's really like a whole language. It uniquely identifies, um, you know, all the, basically, you know, each mapping, each coordinate reference system has like a center point. It has boundary points. It has, you know, how, what, how many units in this system represent how many miles on the Earth or kilometers on the Earth. All this information can be specified in Proj4 strings. So if you look at... Um, so like the Virginia Department of Transportation yeah. has, has coordinates in every sixteenth of an inch from yeah. the extreme southwest corner. Right. Of I believe it. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, I mean, Proj4 strings, like longer ones, this one is, an, I need to find like a really arbitrarily comp complicated Proj4 string. Um, let me just take like this crazy one, uh, like one of these. The Proj4 strings are really long. They define what units, they define you know, how many units of latitude correspond to how many units of this system. You can see it's, it's just like there's a lot of numbers in them. Uh, <laughs> bless you if you're interested in getting into this. I'm not. But uh, it's uh, some of the simpler Proj4 strings, though, like the one I showed you first, the WGS84 one, um, they don't have all that data contained in them. 
because they're well known. And so when you see this, internally, you know, the libraries that are inside these R packages know what that means. It's like a well-known identifier. Um, but you can roll your own you know, uh, coordinate reference system and just specify every bit of data uh, right in the proj4 string. Um, yeah, I really want to stop talking about this now. So, uh, <laughs> right. so, um, so, right. So what we've done now is, uh, through this magic, we've transformed this, um, this coordinate reference system that was used by the San Francisco neighborhood's shapefile to um, the latitude and longitude coordinate reference system, which is called WGS84. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, the reason why a lot of these other coordinate reference systems are used, you might just be asking why the heck don't they all use latitude and longitude, is because if you're doing something like surveying um, within a given city or county or a uh, small area, if you use a, a specific locally you know, appropriate coordinate reference system, it simplifies all the math. You don't have to calculate great circle distances. You can just use basic math to calculate what's the distance from here to there. Um, and so you know, it's used, those local coordinate reference systems, systems are used for that reason. Um, so the people aren't just crazy for using them. It's, it's for a good reason, but it, it does create complexity. Um, but the key to resolving that complexity is this SP transform function again. All right, so um, once we get, once we convert that uh, coordinate reference system, then we can use this proj4 string function again. This tells us what is the current coordinate reference system proj4 string of that object. And now this new transformed object, I've just put a dot xf on the end of it for transformed. Um, you can see now it's this WGS84. It's appended some other junk to the end of it, which is meaningless, but uh, it's that WGS84 system. And if you call the bounding box function on it, then you see, wow, we finally have things that actually look like latitude and longitude. Um, you know, the longitude uh, is the negative in the, in the um, northern hemisphere. Um, it's, you know, or in the western hemisphere, we've got negative uh, longitudes. And in the northern hemisphere, we've got positive latitudes. I hope I said that right. So, um, so those, are, th those look, look uh, appropriate now. Um, all right. So, Say you then wanted to write that shape file out, so you'd have exactly the same thing you started with, but the data would be represented in latitude longitude coordinates. There is also a whole set of functions in R for writing shape files. Um, and the key thing is the write OGR function. So you pass to it um, your spatial object, the location of the file you would want to output, um, and then the layer name and the type of file. And you know you can look at the documentation for that file. That's also in the RG doll package. Um, and it can write not just Esri shape files, but lots of different formats. Uh, and I'll, I'll, we can open up the, the doc page for it later and um, look at that more. All right, um, so that I'm done talking about shape files for a moment. Um, one of the most common things you'll want to do with spatial data, I said earlier, is to take polygons like the neighborhoods of San Francisco and points like restaurants in San Francisco. I used to live in San Francisco for a couple years, and uh, I do miss some of the restaurants. The Asian food is so much better than in the Raleigh area. I'm sorry. Uh, I miss it. But, uh, and cheaper, too. Um, but... Uh, um, so I have this file that contains all the information about every restaurant in San Francisco. Um, I, and th I have it in a text file. It's uh, quite a large text file. And it's actually available for download along with this code. So you can have this as well. Um, I won't tell you it's Providence, because I'm not 100% sure that I'm actually uh, allowed to share that. But if I don't tell you, you won't know. Um, and I'm being recorded, shoot. Uh, <laughs> but this is just basic latitude, longitude points data. So you don't need to use anything fancy. It's just you can use read.csv, read.table, um, whatever. I'm using the read.table function. This is nothing special in R. Uh, if you know the first thing about R, you know about that function. So reading that in, and then um, I'm just removing missing values from it. Uh, missing values are a thorn in the side of a lot of this geospatial stuff in, in R. So uh, highly recommended that if you start doing any of this um, data wrangling or, or analysis, you just get rid of your missing values uh, if possible or you know, separate them if possible beforehand. Um, so I, I'm removing the missing rows. Now I've got 
this data, which is um, is all the restaurants in San Francisco. There's 6,500 of them. And you can see, if you look at the first three rows of this, it's like the name, address, postal code, telephone number, website, and then latitude and longitude of these restaurants. But we don't know what neighborhood they're in. This data that I downloaded um, did not come with information about what neighborhoods these restaurants are in. So say you'd like to know that, how would you find out? Well, this is exactly what geospatial overlay is for. Um, but before we can combine this data with the polygons defining the neighborhoods, we need to do a couple other things. We need to make this restaurant's data into another kind of object defined by the SP uh, package. And these are not polygons, these are points. So we'll be creating a spatial points object um, to define all these restaurants in San Francisco. So again, you can look at this, this spatial points function, but it just basically <laughs> takes a matrix that uh, has latitude and longitude coordinates in it or other x, y coordinates, and then it takes a coordinate reference system. Well, here we're lucky the data is already in latitude and longitude. So this is this familiar WGS84 uh, CRS proj4 string. Um, and we create that object. This is a the class of this restaurants.sp object is spatial points. All right, so, um, and we can take, we can do a bounding box on this now. This is a bounding box of all of the restaurants in San Francisco, which is going to be about the same as all the neighborhoods. And we can plot this too. Um, and it, uh, in this case, the defaults are just a uh, principal crosshair symbol right there for each restaurant. Um, all right, so now we'll get into the spatial overlay bit. So if we have two objects that are um, uh, objects of um, objects that are objects that are defined by the SP package, then we can do spatial overlay with them. And this basically is, you know, there's other names for this. Uh, if you're trying to figure out what points are inside what polygons, it's called geofencing. Sometimes I bet many people have heard that term. Um, you can also do things like finding line intersections. Um, and things like that, finding what lines cross what polygons. Um, but the most common sort of simple case here is that we've got polygons. We want to figure out what points are in what polygons. So we take the points and the polygons, and we use this operator that's defined by the SP package called, or actually, I'm not even sure if it's defined by SP or RGDAL. Those packages are intertwined. But uh, it's it, the over operator. Um, there's also a function called over if you prefer using functions instead of operators. Um, but the outcome is the same. What it creates is a data frame. Um, and what that data frame gives you is, in this case, what neighborhood, what is the name of the neighborhood that every restaurant is in? Um, so maybe I'll just like open our studio and show you like what that actually. Overlay yeah. Right. This is a this is a spatial points. Sorry, this is a spatial polygons data frame defining the neighborhoods of San Francisco. That .xf is just to say that it's transformed into um, latitude longitude coordinates, and this is a spatial points object defining all the points of the restaurants in San Francisco. So the over is basically like points over polygons, and what it gives you. You can see this in the documentation for the over operator and function. It tells you exactly what it gives you in each case. But in the case of points over polygons, what you get out is the ID of the polygon in which each point is. So that, what you get here is the neighborhood name of every single uh, neighborhood that these restaurants are in. So um, does, that, does that make sense? On your second, yes. far right of the second line, is that a typo or is that a Alias for the neighborhood name? Uh, yeah, um, I think that the, the same people who made like Windows 3.1 made Esri shape files because they can't have more than like how many characters is that? At Ten or twelve <laughs> characters in the name. Uh, so the the OD got you know got cut off because Esri shape files cannot have I they, they cannot have long names. Uh, the the columns in Esri shape files can only have like. Uh, names with valid characters and only to a certain length. So you will have some strange things like that where um, the names get truncated. But that's deliberate, yeah. I think for compatibility with the, uh, the D-based files that they, that they run out. OK, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> but that makes sense. It's a feature. <laughs> All right, so um, and actually, uh, 
uh, one of the cool things about using Markdown is that there cannot actually be any errors in, in this content because it has to run before I, uh, I put it up on the screen here. So uh, it's, it, it's valid and you can run all the same code um, later. But okay, so what I've done now is I've taken this, um, so what's outputted from this function is actually a data frame, but we're just interested in the neighborhood column of that data frame, which gives us what neighborhood is each restaurant in. We convert it to character because it's by default a factor. And then we put it um, as a new column on the restaurant's data frame. So now we have a column in our restaurant's data frame that is called neighborhood that says exactly what neighborhood each restaurant is in. So now here's the rest of first three rows of the restaurant's data frame. And we can see neighborhood is there. So American Box is in the financial district and so forth. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and that's, you know, now we can like start to make some insights about, okay, what is the pattern of restaurants in San Francisco? So for instance, one of the most obvious things you might want to do is uh, use the table function in R. Again, this is nothing special, geo, not a geospatial thing, but the table function in R um, to just look at uh, what is the frequency uh, with which certain neighborhoods occur in this data frame. And then if you sort that uh, in descending order, you see that the financial district has the most neighborhoods. Downtown has, you know, um, fewer and on down. Um, all right, so um, I'll stop there for any questions before I continue. Does that, does that all make sense? Yeah. Can you comment on the runtime of an overlay like that? Like when does it start to slow down? How long that took? It's pretty fast. So the, the spatial overlay stuff, and almost all of what I've showed you so far, is not limited by our internals, really. It's, it, the speed of it is defined by how quickly these libraries that are, these open source libraries that are part of R through the SP and RG doll packages, how fast do they go? And they're fast, they're really fast. They're, um, um, you know, R gets a bad rap for being like slower than Python and many things, and there's no end to how many, you know, Packages are out there to try to speed up R, you know, RCPP and data dot table and all this stuff. But um, it, R is actually not markedly slower than Python or any other tool when it comes to doing these kind of geospatial calculations because most of the time it's just taken up in, you know, libraries that are written in like C, um, not with not with actual R code. So it, they they run quickly. Uh, when you're doing analysis, not so much this wrangling, things can start to get really slow. Um, because it's all just determined by how you know well the R package author program things, but this stuff's pretty fast. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, another thing you might want to do um, is calculate, say, the areas of polygons, or you might want to calculate the perimeter. And there is a function called area polygon. Um, and there's other similar functions like th that can calculate the length of lines and things like that in your um, um, you know, projected coordinate reference system, or some of them can, can you know, we'll, we'll give you, uh, just take latitude, longitude coordinates, and then give you kilometers or meters or miles back. Um, this area polygon function, I, I actually don't remember which package it's a part of, um, but it, it takes latitude, longitude data, and gives you, um, it gives you square meters out, and then you can div uh, divide by you know this number to get square miles. Uh, so uh, if we pass this transformed neighborhoods, um, you know uh, spatial polygons object, uh, which is in latitude longitude coordinates to area polygon, uh, and then take the sum of all the rows of that all 37 rows, I think um, you get 47 square miles. So that's the land area of San Francisco, and that. Actually, more or less checks out with what Wikipedia says, so I must be right if Wikipedia says that. Yeah. So that makes me realize I didn't really understand the transformation of a polygon to latitude longitude. So you're taking a polygon. Right. What do you mean that you're transforming it to discrete latitude longitudes? Oh, every, no, you're just taking every point of the polygon and transforming the x and y coordinate of every point to the x to latitude and longitude. It's every polygon in line is defined by points. Um, there's, there's no sense of like a curve or something like that. So, you know, when you're defining a polygon, it's just all points connected by straight lines. There's no way for R uh, or, any, or any of these spatial data formats to say like, 
okay, draw a curve between these two points. It's just all, you know, is if you want to create a curve, you need like a million points uh, for the curve to be smooth. So but this is going to be a million latitude longitude. Yes. Really, 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 really. really yeah, exactly. So yeah, you so if. It's an approximation of a polygon. It it's is. An approximation of a polygon. Yeah, in the sense that you can never draw exactly a circle because a circle is a perfect theoretical idea. Same thing here. These are not really. Um, I mean, they're just a bunch of points connected together with lines that, that approximate a perfect polygon. And actually, it's interesting. If you go on the Census Bureau website or the things like the uh, NOAA website, you know, the, uh, and you look up areas of counties and things like that, um, often they'll, they'll give you different versions. They'll give you high-resolution polygons, and they'll give you like lower, coarser-resolution polygons that are much smaller. So um, if you're doing like... You know, weather alerts. Uh, so you want to let people know when a tornado is hitting their area. You need to use the high accuracy ones. But if you're just trying to do some like lightweight work and you want it to go faster, you don't have to download a giant file. You can use the low resolution ones. So yeah, there are, polygons in R are just a series of points that define an area, and then you can also there's a possibility for there to be holes inside that area, um, but they're all just points uh, underlying it. All of those points are doing a calculation of the area. That could be a that could be a really lengthy calculation. They go quickly, um, but if you were trying to do, yeah, I mean, it would. You, if you were trying to do a uh, huge amount of this, it would. It could. It could take some some time, but yeah. Again, yeah. Most of these these functions are. They end up being pretty fast because they're based on uh, compiled code that runs underneath R. So. Do you, do you know if other other uh, programs that do the same kind of like geofencing? Yeah, I'll it's talk. It seems like a lot of people have, you know, like yeah. one mile radius of a point. Right, yeah. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, more about that later, but I'm sure, like, you know, you can do this in Python, you can do this in other tools. Um, and if, for some of the simpler things, you can just go and find the math and do it yourself in any language. Um, drawing a point, uh, drawing a circle around a specific point on the Earth is not too complicated. It takes like, maybe like, you know, 20 lines of, of code, and you can find it a million places on Stack Overflow. So, um, but it's nice to not have to do it at all, you know, in R. Um, yeah. But I'll, I'll talk more about a, another common tool in a bit. Um, so, what we get out of this, if we take the names of the neighborhoods uh, and put them back, uh, assign them as the names of the uh, the area object, the area um, uh, vector. Then we sort it and display. We can see the Bayview neighborhood is the largest. It's 4.8 square miles, and so on. Um, and then from there, I haven't showed it, but you know you could easily um, join this join this area data back together with the um, neighborhoods data or the the you know what neighborhoods are what what restaurants are in what neighborhoods, and you could find out like what's the density of restaurants within each neighborhood. And if you do that, you actually find out that. Uh, um, Chinatown has a lot of restaurants in San Francisco, so um, it's also a very small neighborhood. All right, um, one other common thing I, I said earlier, great circle distance. Uh, say you want to calculate the distance between San Francisco and New York. You have the latitude and longitude of each. Um, San Francisco is at that longitude, that latitude. Um, well, there are um, a variety of functions, actually, because there is not just one way to calculate great circle distance. There are several approximations to great circle distance, including the Haversine, Haversine approximation, the cosine approximation, the ellipsoid sphere. <laughs> There's a bunches of them. Haversine is a good all-purpose one um, for most, most uh, things. That's what I've been told anyway. Um, so you pass to this function the latitude and longitude of one point. This is um, San Francisco. And then the latitude and longitude of another point, New York. And then you give it a radius, which is um, the radius of the Earth and whatever units you want it to be in. So you can use this number for miles. That's the radius of the Earth in miles. This number for meters. And then it spits out a number that is in the units that you've used. Um, so what we see here is that in miles, I've used the number for miles. Uh, it's 2,568 miles between uh, New York and San Francisco. And those functions are all defined in the geosphere package. Um, and they're, those, some of those, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, some of those are coded actually purely in R code, so I can imagine some of those running a little slower. Um, so a lot of the things that I've shown, I've kind of showed how to do it the hard way. Uh, the read OGR and write OGR functions that I showed you are like the Swiss Army knife tools for 
um, for reading and writing spatial data. However, there are some convenience functions. Uh, the map tools package specifically provides several nice convenience functions, including read shape poly and write shape poly. Um, it's nice because you don't have to worry about all the layer names and all that junk, but at the same time, it has some problems, like it doesn't automatically read in the coordinate reference system. The read, RG, the read OGR function does. Uh, this one does not, so you need to let it know what the coordinate reference system is. Um, so, you know, take your pick, but uh, check out map tools if, um, if you like, you know, shortcut methods. Um, th they're a little, you know, more compact in some cases than what's in the uh, RG doll package. Uh, and then, right, so what I imported here, I didn't explain it, was a shapefile of um, counties in North Carolina. And this actually is part of the map tools package. So I haven't downloaded it or anything. It's inside a file in the map tools package called uh, shapes sids.shp. Um, and so I can read that in like this. It's an object called nc1, and then I can plot it, and you see all the counties in North Carolina. Um, and I'll, I'll use this data to show one other thing. Um, sometimes you're interested in combining together uh, polygons, or you might be interested in taking the difference between polygons or the intersection of them. Uh, let's look at the union, uh, the case of taking a union of these polygons. So what we can do, this is from an example inside one of these packages, the RGOS package. Um, you can take all the coordinates of the, the counties in North Carolina and then use this R function, which is not really a geospatial function, just a standard R function called cut, which defines cut points. Um, you can use this function for like a bunch of different things, um, like where to, how many axis markers to put on your plot. But it's nice. It, it was nice here in this case for um, defining what are the quantile, what are some quantiles of um, all the the latitudes in North Carolina, um, or all the I guess it's longitudes. Yeah, all the longitudes in North Carolina. By default, it splits. Um, all the longitudes in North Carolina into four buckets, and it gives us, you know, upper and lower bounds for each of those four buckets. Um, then we can pass um, those cut points and the original county's shapefile to this gunary union function, which is part of the RGOS package. There's two functions, gunion and gunary union, and they're just basically the same, except that they they format the output differently. Um, unary union, union puts everything in like one. Um, output object. Um, and then from there, we can see, we can plot that resulting object. And now we see uh, we have counties, we have these four groupings of counties in North Carolina. It, has, it hasn't drawn the lines arbitrarily, it's drawn them on county borders. So this is, um, you know, we've basically taken the union of counties whose, like, I think whose center point is in um, different, you know, of the four. Um, you know, the westernmost and so forth onto easternmost part of North Carolina. So um, probably different than what politicians would do if they were, you know, in control. It's all crazy and nothing makes sense. But, uh, you know, we, yeah, we, we live in, what is it, the first or second most gerrymandered state in the, uh, the country. So um, I'm sure they, they don't use computers to do anything. They use their political wits. So. Or they're just they use political operative. Well, right, yeah, I shouldn't. I hired yeah. political operative to do that. Right, yes. Um, all right, so uh, I mentioned the, this spatial reference whoops, um, resource. There's one other website also. Uh, one thing I didn't mention is that these long proj4 strings um, are a little tedious to work with. Well, there's actually a nice system of short integer numbers that uniquely define every single um, coordinate reference system, and they're called EPSG codes. And if I go back here for a second, uh, this WGS84 coordinate reference system, for example, has this EPSG code attached to it, 4326. Um, this is, it, this, it stand, the EPSG stands for like European Petroleum something. It's this like industry group, but that doesn't really matter. What you, know, uh, you should just remember is that it's just uh, unique identifiers, numeric unique identifiers for every single coordinate reference system. Um, any of these have EPSG codes. Um, so even that crazy Virginia nonsense that you were talking about, I'm sure it has an EPSG code. So um, an alternate way of figuring out what coordinate reference system your data has 
is to use EPSG codes. And if you um, download a shapefile, there's something in the shapefile called the .prj file. And if you open that .prj file, um, I don't even have any apps installed on my Mac yet. But uh, uh, if you open that up, it has a text string in it. And um, if you paste that text string here and click Convert, it'll, it gives you a EPSG code, which is a lot more compact and easier to work with. Um, and as you get, if you start to get into this, you'll, you'll find that EPSG codes are a really convenient way to refer to coordinate reference systems. Um, you know, because you're not going to remember to say to someone, oh, that's that, you know, and then re, you know, rehearse this whole uh, string out to people each time. Uh, yeah, it's some global standard at this point. It was originally a, like a, a for-profit group that did something about petroleum exploration, but uh, at this point, it's like I think it's in the hands of some like not-for-profit group. It's uh, three, two, one, four, seven. What's that one? Oh. <laughs> That's great. Three, two, one. It is. Yeah, there you go. So each one, you know, very easy. And, and yet, look at the Proj4 code for it. You know, it's like Proj4 string. It's super long. So um, EPSG codes are a nice way to refer to. Oh, so here, so here. Let me let me show you. Uh, if you want to know what these PRJ files, their inside shape files, look like, ah, oh, damn, it's now it's opening again um, in a file. But uh, there's a bunch of ways again to represent these coordinate reference systems. One is actually something called well-known text. You can paste that in here too. Uh, and then click convert, and it'll give you three, two, one, four, seven back. So it's this is a nice conversion engine um, for all these, uh, um, yeah, all these uh, coordinate reference systems to EPSG codes. Do so they start with four, four digit signifiers? Yeah, well, yeah, four, four digits is the minimum. Some of, some of them have like seven or eight, I think, but no yeah. <laughs> no, um, no, there's there's not unfortunately uh, for yeah, hitchhikers. Fans, that would be clever. Um, you can invent it, but <laughs> um, okay. So uh, I think Nathan or someone asked a question about what other tools do people use. Um, one of the biggest tools that people use for this stuff, if they're not inclined to pay uh, five or six figure sums to uh, Esri, is this tool QGIS, um, which is a free open source GIS uh, desktop software. Um, this is a really nice piece of software. Um, it doesn't really do anything that R can't do, but it's all point and click. And um, it makes it really easy to do certain things. Um, also, sometimes you'll read in, you'll try to read a shapefile into R, and it'll be like broken some, because someone messed up creating it. Uh, QGIS seems to be a little bit more robust about opening those things, despite there being errors in them. Um, I definitely recommend downloading it. Um, I think I don't know if it's available for all platforms, but it's a very nice piece of software. Um, not as powerful as the paid, you know, the, the commercial Esri tools, but uh, um, pretty nice. Does anyone use this? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Is that a good Any, start if you've got some data and just need to do it? But... Yeah, if you just want to like do a quick and dirty visualization of some data, shapefile data or um, quick and dirty kind of uh, geofencing spatial overlay, this is pretty easy to use as well. Is it done in Windows? I, does it, yeah, I know it runs in Windows. Has anyone used it on a Mac? Is it? Everything. Everything. OK, it's probably Java, yeah. No, no, no. Oh, no, it's not Java? Oh, really? OK, cool. So someone did some nice work to make the UI work. And does anyone have it? Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. If 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 I'm still blathering on by eight forty five, kick me out. But yeah, thank you. We have a while. That yeah, that's that's uh, over an hour away. So we're we're good. Actually, you've got three slides to go. You've got three slides to cover. Oh, this is one of six decks I have. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Well, y you can, but it's a lot of work, and it, it yeah. Um, if you're trying to quickly 
visualize data in an interactive way? Well, I know, I mean, someone who's used QGIS, can anyone chime in about like what is the the value of QGIS? Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you can do pretty maps, if that's the question. Yeah. And, and it, it also yeah. enters the processing part, and it uh, takes advantage of, of other GIS packages, so you can do, uh, I think you can do more than you can do in R. Well, you, can, you can call R functions from QGIS through something which is called processing. You cool. can use R in this way, or well, since I'm talking now. So uh, there is also Grass GIS, also open source GIS. And not only that you can use Grass GIS from QGIS, but you can use Grass GIS from R itself. So there is, as you were talking about R GDAO, there is R Grass 7 package. Yeah. Or formerly SP Grass 6. Yeah. And, uh, you can use the grass functions from there, from, from R, so then you can use all, like, all these fancy geo algorithms as, in the same way as, as usual for geo. Yeah, yeah, that's what, that's a, it's a good, thanks for, for sharing that. Yeah, um, uh, QGIS is super powerful uh, if, from my experience, and uh, I, I think it is better than R at certain things. It doesn't have the, Amount of community, you know, extensions to it that R has, of course, but uh, it's it's a really nice piece of software. But yeah, well, I mean, what um, on your last point there? Uh, there are all there are so many of these like libraries, these geospatial calculation libraries that are out there. A lot of them were created by like you know really brilliant um, academics, um, and there are. Uh, a bunch of them are in R. Uh, GDAL is the one that's you know most deeply you know in, in, in meshed in R. But um, the uh, the other p package that I mentioned, um, Geos, um, R, the R Geos package uses uh, Geos is another one of these libraries. Grass is another. There's like uh, probably even more. I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Last weekend we were playing with GGMap, and it looks like it's a very new uh, tool out there in Grass. So yeah. Just, uh, they just put it out in March. So. Cool. Yeah, I haven't used graphics much, and one of the reasons why is because when I have to do the graphics stuff, I use Spotfire, which my employer forces me to use. But it's, it's an awesome tool. Um, but it's easy to draw maps in Spotfire uh, and in other software like Tableau as well. Um, yeah. When it comes to mapping on QGIS, does it map the um, other part of the world? like? Uh, Middle East, Far East. Oh, does QGIS include a base map? Like, if you want to have like a Google Map style base map, like under your data in QGIS, will it do that? Well, you can have uh, WMS. Oh, okay. Services. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. What is that? Yeah. So, th there's um, QGIS and R and all these tools. Spotfire can reach out to the web and get um, base map tiles. So, and most of them will do global base map tiles. Um, I can zoom into like, you know, a remote area of Botswana here and get like the roads. It's, it's, it's amazing. You can do that in Spotfire, um, and I, I know you can do it in the other tools too. Some of the tools have like a built-in base map system, which is sometimes like licensed uh, from a company. Um, a lot of them derive from OpenStreetMap or Google. Um, but there's also uh, base maps that are hosted on these web map services or WMS servers. And you can, uh, um, some of those, they, they tend to not quite be uh, as good as the Google ones, but they're all right, yeah. Um, was, that, was that a fair <laughs> characterization? Okay. No, open street maps are pretty good, but they don't have the aerial photograph. Uh, yeah. The data. Right? Okay. On the other hand, you can download the data from open street maps. And then you, you do your analysis on OpenStreetMap data rather than the county data. And they are actually comparable quality. Cool. I believe there would be some tool to download it to, to R, but I'm, I can't tell the name. I'm not sure. OK, yeah. All right, well, actually, the next thing I was going to say was just that um, I you know, am giving a fairly narrow um, view into all this. However, there is, wait, where is it? No. This is this is it. Um, if you're looking for a broader p 
picture of what you can do with geospatial work in R. There is this series of pages called CRAN task views on the CRAN website, you know, the R package repository website. And this one called the uh, analysis of spatial data task view, it just goes on and on and on. I mean, it's like, uh, it, it, you know, it's organized in sections like here's functions that are packages that have functionality for importing and exporting data. Whoops. Um, here's packages that do all kinds of analyses. Here's, you know, um, reading and writing, reading and writing other point. Yeah, there's some stuff there for uh, open street maps I saw. Um, yeah, OpenStreetMap gives access to OpenStreetMap raster images. So you can get, you know, base maps under your maps in, in R. Uh, and then you get into analysis, um, point pattern analysis, and, you know, geostatistics, and it just goes on and on, and we're less than halfway through. Um, so check out this page. Uh, if you want to search for things like KML, um, yep, there you go. So plot KML is a package of writing methods for the visualization of Google Earth KML data. Um, the, you know, it, you look up anything here, search the page, and it, it's probably there. Um, and this points to hundreds of R packages. You know, there's like over 6,500 or I, I don't, how many R packages are there now? Over 7,000 maybe? I don't know. It's huge. And um, there's a, a good number of spatial ones as well. Uh, and there's a good amount of replication. Often you'll find that three packages do basically the same thing. So um, that's becoming a bit of an issue with R. Um, all right. Uh, and then one other thing, um, I didn't talk much about creating maps, uh, vi you know, actual visualizations of spatial data. I just showed how you can call the plot function on a few basic objects. However, there is a, a whole um, page here um, that talks about, I don't know why, there we go. Uh, it's a GitHub repository and a accompanying like PDF sort of book length type thing um, that, let me, yeah, that talks all about visualizing spatial data and it's very introductory level and it's kept up to date. Um, so check this out or just start Googling, you know, uh, how to visualize spatial data or graph spatial data or plot spatial data in R and you'll find lots of good stuff. Um, it's very powerful. Um, and you're likely to see in anything, you're likely to see at the beginning of it, the kind of stuff I, I talked about, how to get the data in, how to get it in the right CRS, et cetera. But then, you know, you can visualize it from there. And that's a whole topic unto itself. Um, like you can layer, you know, data, you can create these uh, different kinds of maps and so forth. Again, I do a lot of that stuff in, in Spotfire, um, which it's, makes it pretty simple. There are other, uh, you know, point and click analytics software that, that can, can work in that way as well. Um, or you can do it in R using code. So yeah, when it comes to analysis, really, um, I'll show a few examples, but this CRAN task you page is, is the place to start. Um, in, so a few examples, uh, it's you know, quite simple to, to do some visual analysis. For instance, um, if we plot here on a map in Spotfire, the number of restaurants per neighborhood, so the colors are horrible here, but um, the financial district pops out as the most restaurants. And then if we plot density of restaurants just by dividing by area, uh, Chinatown pops out as the, the densest concentration of restaurants. Um, there's a, you can create interactive applications with tools like Spotfire using R under the hood to do um, geo calculations. For instance, here's something I made pretty quickly in Spotfire that lets you click on an, any airport. These dots all represent airports sized by how many daily departures they have. And then it shows you, uh, it's really not bright enough, um, it shows you how, um, yeah, all the airports that that connects to. This data is, I think, from a few years ago, so you don't see some of the RDU connections to San Francisco and so forth. But um, what I was able to do was to use R to give me all these points along the great circle arcs and then bring those into Spotfire and, and plot them. Um, so you can, you can do some powerful stuff. And then, you know, like uh, something like this, um, a, like a data scientist, R savvy type person can uh, put it in the hands of a, a much you know less data science focused uh, user, and they can they can draw some amazing analyses um, from this kind of thing. Um, there's some some cool analyses as well. Uh, Voronoi diagrams are one of the uh, the neater looking 
uh, kinds of geospatial analyses. So these dots each represent all the airports in the United States, and um, the polygons around them represent all the area that is closest to that airport, closer to that airport than any other airport. So um, if we zoom into you know North Carolina, you can see at some point the roads will actually show up, and you'll see like you know. Okay, that's why it's my roads. Well, no, these are not roads; these are just polygons, but um, they're just distance. But if you zoom in the map, which derives from OpenStreetMap, will start to show layers like roads underneath it. No, they are in this case birds. Yeah, I mean they're yeah they're they're just defined by geographical distance, not by like along roads or anything like that. Voronoi diagram, V O R O N O I, and there are R packages that can make these diagrams. They're pretty cool. There's um there's a is anyone used D three dot js the D three graphics library? Yeah. So the 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 guy who made D three named Mike Bostock loves these things. He's got like. A plethora of these on his website, and this was inspired by by a D3 uh, Voronoi diagram. Um, but the same thing can be done, you know, using R and a mapping tool. Uh, in this case, I'm using Spotfire as my mapping tool. You could use the Google Maps with its JavaScript APIs would also be another way to uh, to use maps. And then underneath the you know the map, you could have what's visualized being driven by R. Um, and Shiny can do some of this stuff too. I don't know if has anyone done any like mapping with uh, the R Studio Shiny tool? Cool. Does it have good maps? I mean, does it, nice. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, maybe you can stand up next time because I don't know anything about that. But uh, cool. Um, and then. Let me see if I have any other examples here. Um, oh, yes, Krieging. <laughs> um, if I can get it open. Yeah, I, I, but I can't get it to open. Hmm. Because you're full screen? Yeah, it should. Well, I don't know. I think maybe it closed. Um, yeah, but I do have, there's an example I've got somewhere here. Um, but I, I'm actually, I can't find it, so I won't show. But it, it's possible to do some really neat things like um, um, with analysis. One of the, one of the things we do uh, at, at Spotfire is work with geographical data. Um, and, you know, geographical data is often, uh, uh, I sorry, I meant geological data. Geological data is often collected um, in very spotty way. You know, people take core samples in random spots, uh, and then for 50 miles in between where there were two core samples taken, you really don't know what the value of those you know geological parameters are. Well, you can use things like Krieging or you know low S smoothing uh, to create a, a smooth curve. Uh, over you know two dimensional space that allows you to interpolate like well what is you know the value of this ge uh, geological measurement likely to be in that area uh, based on that that smoothing um, and we do a lot of interesting work like that and all of that stuff is you know again uh, covered in this uh, this spatial data um, CRAN task view page there's a lot of powerful stuff there are there any uh, three dimensional uh, analyses or is it all two dimensional. There's some three-dimensional stuff, but there's mo what there's more of is um, temporal spatial stuff. So where time is another dimension that you're adding to it. But there's certainly, yeah. I mean, I I'm not familiar with it, but I'm sure there is. Um, there's 3D as well. Yeah. Is that Cran task view page pretty easy? To find? It is. Yeah. You just Google um, Cran. Task view spatial or the URL is up there, but you probably can't see it too well. Um, yep. And there's a, these CRAN task views in general are just really excellent resource um, for anything, you know, not just spatial data, not just spatial analysis, but um, there's a bunch of them um, covering, you know, diverse fields. Yep. All right. Well, that's um, that's everything I have to present. So questions? Yeah, you, one back there. Right. It does not contain the elevation at all? No, yeah. In, so the, the ba all the stuff I showed you is really around uh, two-dimensional data. Um, there are extensions of it to three-dimensional. I'm not familiar with them. Um, 
like that. Well, yeah. Well, one of the things to keep in mind is that remember, there's these um, there's these objects uh, that that are the core of. Just hold on one second. Um, that are the core of the you know the any kind of spatial work you do, um, spatial points, lines, and polygons. If you're just adding a three dimension, a third dimension to your data in a sort of non-continuous way, but like in a point way, like this polygon has this you know number assigned to it, then you can use the data frame objects and just like add more dimensions in the data frame. Um, but in terms of like de you know defining like three dimensional surfaces, I'm not familiar. Is that, has anyone done any work with like three dimensional? Usually, yeah. Um, Have you? <laughs> Instead of, so longitude and latitude are continuous, but if you're doing it with the altitude, what do you do? You can bucket it. So you, instead of saying uh, continuous up and down, you bucket into different segments. So if you want to say, uh, you know, wind, you say, well, I want this bucket, and I got a 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 bucket, and that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Has anyone done any of that kind of work? Yeah. You don't use uh, like points and polygons, usually use rasters, and that's like the whole new world. In a spatial. Um, yeah, I haven't talked about that at all. There's <laughs> a package called Raster, which is very powerful and very fast. Which you, what you, and you need, need it to be fast because, like, it's a matrix. Raster is a matrix of file, uh, like cells, right, numbers, but it's very huge. So the Raster package in R actually can be very nice. And so if, if I understand, so the difference between sort of raster data uh, in, in a spatial sense and this data is that, like, say you had raster, say you, say you were trying to define a polygon with raster data. You'd have a giant matrix of, um, of ones and zeros for all of San Francisco, and you'd have one neighborhood defined by this giant matrix. And it would have a zero for every location that was not in the neighborhood, and then a one for every location that was in the neighborhood. And you know, it's just this very large data format, which does extend to higher dimensionalities. But instead of defining boundaries and specific features, it defines everything with large matrices you know, in arbitrary numbers of dimensions. Is that, was that? Yeah, okay. And in this case, it sounds really bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> for, the, for the things like terrain, it's yeah. continuous and like you need yeah. information on every place. Then you say, oh, with like one foot grid, I can like nicely cover my area. And like that's exactly what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Has anybody come across any kind of vignettes relative to transportation distances or so looking for distances along? Yeah. So, yeah. So, OpenStreetMap and Google, um, and there might be others, but I know those two have uh, within their data, you know, ways to calculate driving distances and itineraries and so forth. And there are a variety of like commercial um, vendors that provide API. Typical is one of them that provides uh, APIs to get driving distances and driving directions and, and all this stuff. Um, and you can, through those APIs, you can get you know, uh, the driving distance between one, from one point to another. And certain kinds of analyses, like um, say you're a big consumer goods company and you want to understand like, how far your customers have to go to buy your products. Uh, as the bird fly distances don't always work because there are giant bodies of water and bridges and traffic and no roads and mountains and things like this. So um, that kind of data is, is really valuable. I I'm not aware of any free and open source way to get that kind of stuff. However, you could do it through Google um, if you, you know, can just process all the stuff they're giving you um, through some of their APIs, I'm sure. But some of them are limited as well. Is, is anyone aware if there's like driving distance calculation R packages or anything? I, I, that would be an interesting one to check out. There are packages, but open source packages. Oh, there are? Like if, you, if you look to openstreetmap.org, they are using at least two different routing algorithms or like routing, routing packages. And then in post GIS, you know, PostgreSQL. Yeah. So there should be some PG routing. 
Okay. Is that hitting the service? Yeah, but are those like software you can download, or is it like a web service or something like that? Not web service. Okay. It, is, it must take up a huge amount of space if you're doing like if you're trying to get all of the entire U.S. road system or something. What's that? Okay, yeah. I know that, that just for reference, if you want to download like all of the base map tiles that define uh, you know the the world at every level of zoom from like Google Maps, it's over two terabytes. So the data sizes get really large. But if you're narrowing down your area and you just need roads or something like that, it could be smaller. But yeah. Yeah. So you said there are many different projection systems, right? Right. So is there a way to choose one? I mean, how do you decide to uh, how do you decide on which which projection system to use for your application? Yeah. Well, so for instance, um, I um, you can make like ad hoc on the fly uh, reference systems that are flat, like in your area, or approximate a flat, you know, Cartesian plane in your specific local area very well. And it's pretty easy to do that if you understand that Proj4 language and you understand you know, coordinate reference systems in general. Um, but in terms of like, how you'd identify like, if one of the specific existing ones is best, I mean, the spatial reference site might have some, some tips on that. Um, and you, know, you can certainly, like, there's specifically this NAT83. See, see this, this Virginia, weird Virginia thing we were talking about um, comes with this NAD83 descriptor before it, which means North American Datum 1983, which uh, at several times in, um, you know, the, there was this big effort to come up with coordinate reference systems that worked throughout the US and that approximated flat Cartesian areas for the purpose of different kinds of calculations in specific areas. So you can look at like all the NAD83 coordinate reference systems. There's some other one, there, I don't know all of them, um, but there's other datums that have been used. Uh, and they all define specific states or regions of states and so forth. So, anyone have any better <laughs> answer to that question? I, I don't, I'll just make sure, make sure you, that, that we understand. So, yeah. you necessarily, when you get the data set, you don't have to decide on one. Like you said, it comes with one, right? So you, yeah, you often when you, right, when you download a shapefile, it's already in some, but if you're making your own data yeah, or something. You get latitude and longitude, and if you need to project it into a. Into oh, oh. Then, okay, so if you're doing mapping. Yeah. Then um, it, you know, the, so web maps have uh, have caused the entire world of mapping to get like a lot simpler than it used to be because there 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 are a lot of coordinate reference systems that people use. I mean, you remember your you know classroom map in in school, probably in the Mercator projection. Um, if anyone uh, ever watched The West Wing, they might remember the inverse Peters projection or something like that. Um, yeah, um, but there are there's one coordinate reference system that's it's sometimes like called the Google coordinate reference system, but it's called Web Mercator. Um, and if you're visualizing your data in almost any software that's web based, um, it's going to sort of default to Web Mercator. Google Maps, everything's Web Mercator. Spotfire, it's, everything's Web Mercator. Um, if you're doing something more custom. Uh, or you're, you know, you, you might have the ability to define your coordinate reference system. I know, like QGIS, for instance, you can map in any coordinate reference system. And what what is it? four minutes left? Four minutes left? Okay, okay. Um, uh, but uh, it yeah, it really varies. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but if you're if you've done your work and you need to go back to your client in different parts of the world and say. This is this is data. You might have to render it back into something that they're more comfortable or used to dealing with. Yeah. Like if you're gonna do something and then say, "Hey, Virginia Department of Transportation," yeah, you'd probably want to render it in that whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I believe that's what they use. Right. Yep. You know, most, most states represent their data in state plane coordinates. Okay. Which are all typically on NAT 83 these days. Okay. But keep in mind there have been seven iterations of NAT 83 <laughs> from NAT 83 86 through NSRS 2007. Okay. Oh, well, always moving. Well, well, actually, it's a, I think it's really a, a refinement of WGS 84 and making it a, a true, a more true Earth mass centered ellipsoid, which gets into the, which gets into the bottom part. Yeah. But, but North Carolina, for example, uses NAT83, but they use a Lambert kind of conformal projection. So different states will either use a conic or Mercator or transverse Mercators based on their shapes. 
Yeah. And, and larger, more regularly sized shapes will have multiple zones in them. So. Yeah, this stuff gets really, really hard, um, really fast. <laughs> and uh, I mean, one of the, the cool things is that R really provides this like abstraction layer above it all that in many cases prevents you from having to get your hands too dirty with those calculations. Um, but there are times when it breaks down and uh, you have to understand how things are working. And then it gets really challenging. But uh, I would encourage you, if you don't plan to you know, really dive into this and learn all this stuff, um, uh, you know, if you kind of stick to what R provides or what tools like QJS provide, I mean, they uh, um, they have really you know easy ways to convert coordinate reference systems and so forth. And um, if you sanity check things, it's hard to go too wrong with that. But yeah, there's a whole world of complexity under under it. Yeah. A uh, question about this uh, great circle. Yeah. Um, so I noticed you you put in a earth radius. Thing. Yep. Um, and my understanding is it calculates the distance based on the curvature of the Earth. Um, presumably, also takes into consideration that it's kind of more flat around the tops. So, you know. Well, yeah. So the uh, the certain so the, again, there's like these four methods I, I um, pointed out here: Haversin, cosine. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce that one. Uh, you know, these different ellipsoid and ellipsoid sphere. Uh, each of these make assumptions about what the shape of the Earth is, and they're, none of them are exactly correct. Some of them are maybe more correct than others in certain cases. Uh, I mean, I don't know, if you, do you have any insight into like when you would use one of these or another? Or? Um, regionally, they'll, they'll take the mean radius of ellipsoids. You know, so North Carolina will use the mean radius of ellipsoid as it passes through North Carolina for doing certain calculate genetic conversion calculations for scale factors. Okay. Um, so, because it's an ellipsoid, so there's a semi-major axis and semi-minor axis, and it's a three-dimensional ellipsoid. And so the radius value is changing depending on which region they're in. Yeah. So <laughs> finding the, what, where the great circle is is kind of going to define what that mean radius is along that circle. Yeah. So it'd be more round if we could just get the Earth to tumble again. <laughs> <laughs> just wait. <laughs> yeah, if 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 you're if you're doing like targeted munitions for the Defense Department, please don't you know use R. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if if you're just trying to figure out like you know how far you are from your distribution center to your store, it's probably okay to just use any of these. But you know. So, it's, so a follow up question. So it's safe to assume that these things probably don't work on other planets because of yeah. gravity and all this. Well, right. Yeah. I mean, if you make the assumption that it's spherical or something like that, uh, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm sure you could using one of these um, great circle distance things that that just assumes that it's a sphere get. Calculations that were approximately accurate on the moon, but I don't know. I mean, yeah, it, uh, everything is close to a sphere, well, but. And then you have to account for traffic. Right, yeah, traffic, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, there might be, but. I think one of the reasons that Haversine is popular is because it's not as accurate, but it's faster. Okay. It's vector, like, it uses basic trick numbers, you know, tricks, so it can be faster. You have to do a lot of calculations. And I might be totally wrong about this, but one of the reasons. Okay. All right, we have a couple minutes. Any other questions, or is that, have we had enough? All right, so yeah, these, um, before.